Hello. So uh, in uh, this particular episode, I'm going to talk about uh, the discovery of Pavlovian conditioning and in particular, the role of object learning. And uh, the reason I wanted to uh, uh, make this uh, a topic for one of these videos is that uh, the story of the discovery of Pavlovian conditioning is not correctly told in most uh, accounts. Uh, most accounts uh, have a diagram kind of like what's in the first slide here, uh, which so shows uh, uh, Pavlov's dog all hooked up to the apparatus. And uh, the story is that uh, Pavlov rang a bell uh, before presenting meat powder to dogs in this situation. And uh, lo and behold, after a while, the dog salivated in response to the bell. And uh, everybody talks about how that was Pavlov's discovery of Pavlovian or salivary conditioning. It turns out uh, there's a couple of things uh, screwy about this account. Um, one is that uh, he never rang a bell. Uh, so uh, we don't need slides for this one. <laughs> so he, he uh, uh, that just uh, ringing a bell before a presentation of meat powder was just a story that somebody made up in order to explain what salivary conditioning was all about. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that Pavlov really didn't discover salivary conditioning. He had a lot of people working in the lab on digestive physiology and salivation as part of digestive physiology. And so they had methods for, for uh, measuring salivation and they were interested in studying the salivary reflex. And they studied the salivary reflex under lots of different conditions. And uh, uh, one of the things that allowed Pavlov to uh, uh, make a lot of progress uh, in this line of work is that he was an expert in survival surgery. So he could uh, uh, do surgery on, uh, on the dogs so as to externalize the salivary duct so that the saliva that was secreted uh, would uh, uh, be collected uh, by a tube that uh, ran to a beaker. Uh, and because he uh, was an expert, in fact, he pioneered survival surgery. Uh, so the dogs not only survived the surgery, but lived for uh, a long time, a couple of years afterwards. Uh, everyone else who tried this kind of procedure, uh, and there was often a lot of infection involved and the animals would die. Uh, but Pavlo was really good at uh, controlling infection and allowing the animals to survive, which then allowed him to test these animals over and over again. It's a lot of trouble to go th uh, through this uh, fistula preparation thing. And uh, if you run the same dogs through these experiments over and over again, they started sal salivating even when they were brought into the experimental room. And uh, this was noticed by everybody in the lab, by technicians and uh, students working in the lab. And they even had a name for it. They called it psychic secretion. And the notion was that uh, this was a secretion of saliva in response to the thought, the psychology, the thought of food. Pavlov himself was uh, really uncomfortable with the phrase psychic secretion because he didn't think it was scientific enough it, that it, uh, uh, it sounded too much like uh, uh, psychic readings or something. Uh, so uh, this phenomena of anticipatory salivation was well known in a lab for years. And uh, it wasn't that Pavlov had to discover it. Uh, what Pavlov discovered and his unique contribution uh, in many ways uh, towards the initiation of a long and, and uh, highly uh, productive line of research on this is he thought about what might be the significance of anticipatory salivation. And uh, his answer to that question uh, was that uh, anticipatory salivation told us something really important about how the brain works, and in particular, how the cerebral hemispheres were, work. And it wasn't until Pavlov landed on that particular interpretation of 
the significance of anticipatory salivation that the lab started to focus on uh, the study of the so-called psychic secretion as the primary subject matter for the laboratory. Uh, this uh, sequence of events where the laboratory supervisor uh, often uh, uh, is much more skillful at interpreting the data that's coming out of the lab than the students and technicians who work in the laboratory. That sort of thing, we will see lots of examples of uh, uh, during the course of the semester, and that's fairly common in science. So who was the one that actually did discovered, uh, did a, a systematic investigation of, uh, of uh, so-called anticipatory salivation and did the first experiments on this. The next slide shows you uh, uh, who this was. This was Stefan Wolfson. The way that Stefan Wolfson doesn't make it into textbooks except the ones that I write. <laughs> but uh, he was actually the... Uh, uh, collaborator in Pavlov's lab who did uh, some of the really crucial initial experiments. And his job, his assignment was to uh, determine what are the mechanics of salivation. So he did these experiments in which he presented uh, various things to uh, dogs and measured how much saliva they produced. And um, in one experiment, he exposed dogs to uh, dry food a number of occasions. Uh, another series of uh, tri trials, the, the dogs were presented with sand in the mouth. They, uh, and another series of experiments, it was sour water. And so these were objects that had a particular visual appearance. And uh, when they're in the mouth, uh, they have uh, orosensory features uh, and they have a certain feel in the mouth. If, you, if I put dry food in your mouth or if I put sand in your mouth, you're going to salivate uh, pretty excessively. And the same thing is true for sour water. So uh, doing these experiments involved taking these objects, repeatedly testing how these object, a given object elicits salivation. And the thing to keep in mind is that these are objects that have multiple features. One of those features is a visual feature, what it looks like before the substance is put into the mouth, and the other is the orosensory feature. And what Wolfson discovered is that after you do a number of these kinds of trials, you can just present the visual cue by itself. You can just show the sand to the dog and he starts to salivate, which means that he, is, <clears throat> he, did, he doesn't do that initially. He doesn't salivate to the visual features of sand at first, but it does salivate to those visual features after he's had a number of experiences with uh, having sand put into, the, seeing the sand and having it put in the mouth. So uh, this is a, a form of object learning. Objects are uh, multi-sensory stimuli. Uh, I could uh, pick an object here. Let me get Get your hair as an object. It's a pen. It has a lot of different features. And uh, uh, what, those, as your experience with the pen uh, leads to the linkages among these features. Like one feature is that it's solid. <laughs> it's a particular shape. And if you write on it, 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 it writes a particular color. Those are all separate features. And because those are all features of the object, if I turn the pen upside down or sideways, those features kind of travel together. <laughs> and that's the nature of objects. Objects have multiple features, and those features travel together by virtue of the fact that they all emanate from the same object. And uh, uh, Wolfson, Wolfson's experiment is particularly important because he demonstrated uh, conditioned salivation in the concept, context of object learning, learning to link together different features of the same object. Now, this has a number of really important implications. One of the things that you read about uh, in uh, 
standard accounts of Pavlovian conditioning is that the conditioned stimulus is a, a uh, neutral cue that's initially unrelated to the unconditioned stimulus. Well, in the object learning paradigm, uh, the conditioned stimulus is a feature of the object which initially does not elicit the salivary response or the response that you're interested in. It's the uh, taste of the sand in the mouth that causes salivation, not what it looks like uh, um, before it's put in the mouth. So the conditioned stimulus uh, is, is not a neutral object. It's not unrelated to the unconditioned stimulus. In fact, it's part of the same object that makes up the unconditioned stimulus. So the notion that Pavlovian conditioning in, uh, occurs with neutral conditioned stimuli, uh, that's, that doesn't make sense from the standpoint of a careful reading of Pavlovian conditioning, and it doesn't make sense in light of a lot of more contemporary research on these phenomena. So viewing Pavlovian conditioning as a form of object learning also tells us that Pavlovian conditioning is going to be a pervasive feature of how we deal with the environment. We're constantly dealing with objects. We're constantly learning about objects and all that kind of learning involves association, uh, learning to link together or associate different features of those uh, uh, their objects. And uh, that makes for Pavlovian conditioning to be a, a pervasive aspect of our experience. If we may uh, look at the next slide. Okay, uh, in this slide, we summarize the, the major features of uh, this object learning and approach analysis of Pavlovian conditioning. So uh, the general proposition is number one, the uncon unconditioned stimuli are complex objects with multiple features, and some of these elicit responding unconditionally, whereas other features do not. Initially, the ineffective features of the US, such as the visual uh, features of sand, <clears throat> those uh, initially ineffective features come to elicit responding through pairings with uh, features that do elicit responding unconditionally. And because of this, CSUS pairings are a natural consequence of how we interact with the environment, which means that outside the laboratory, conditioned stimuli are not arbitrary, they're not neutral cues, but they have an inherent pre-existing relationship with the unconditioned stimulus. And that enables Pavlovian conditioning to occur in all kinds of situations in our daily experience. We're constantly interacting with objects and we're constantly learning about objects. Uh, the iPhone is an object that has a lot of different features. And we learn about those ob ob uh, that object by learning what the features are and how they're related to one another. That kind of thing occurs with uh, you know, coffee cups, <laughs> all kinds of objects, far less complicated uh, than an iPhone. They, uh, object learning is a pervasive aspect of our daily experience, which means that Pavlovian conditioning is going to be a pervasive feature of our daily experience. And because of that, Pavlovian conditioning has been observed in all kinds of situations. So the next slide uh, provides a partial list of all the uh, uh, various situations in which Pavlovian conditioning has been investigated. And in each of these categories, there, there are dozens and dozens of experiments. Of course, digestion is a big topic, uh, defensive behavior, drug conditioning, is a huge topic. There's a lot of contemporary interest in drug conditioning. Nursing and maternal behavior involve lots of uh, aspects of Pavlovian conditioning. There's been studies of Pavlovian conditioning of aggression, of sexu sexual behavior, and even the conditioning of immune reactivity. So 
Pavlovian conditioning is here, there, and everywhere. So anyone who suggests that Pavlovian conditioning is is not of great interest because it just has to do with uh, salivary conditioning. Anyone who makes that suggestion is really pretty far from the mark. And so we'll uh, show lots of these examples uh, uh, in, in uh, the rest of, uh, rest of the class. So that's my story for today. And uh, thanks for your attention. I look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.